Hi there, my name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and I would like to welcome you to the 32nd lecture of ECE 3084 Signals and Systems here in the summer 2020 semester. In the last lecture, we proved a property regarding taking integrals of functions in the time domain. And today we're going to deal with the dual property and ask what happens in the Laplace domain if we take the derivative of the function in time. So we're going to use the exact same technique we used in the previous lecture, which is to insert the thing we're taking the Laplace transform of into the Laplace transform integral. We're integrating against e to the minus st over time. And we'll once again use integration by parts, usually generically stated as the integral of u dv being equal to u times v minus the integral of v du. So we need to figure out what u and dv are going to be. So it will make sense to have this e to the minus st be our u. So du is minus s e to the minus st dt. So that would mean that this derivative expression along with this dt would equal our dv. Fortunately, from the fundamental theorem of calculus, we know that integrals and derivatives are opposites. And you could also be a little crass and just write something like that if you wanted, I suppose. And we wind up with v being just x of t. All right, so substituting these things in, I have e to the minus st, which is our u, times v, which is just xt. And this is all going to be evaluated at t equals zero and infinity. And now we're going to subtract the integral of v, which here is just x of t, times du, which is this minus s e to the minus st dt. We'll need to make an assumption that this e to the minus st xt drops down to zero as t goes to infinity. And that would need to happen for the Laplace transform of x to exist anyway. So the only thing that we're actually left with is plugging t equals zero into e to the minus st xt. So obviously if we plug in zero to e to the st, e to the zero is one. So I'm just left with x evaluated at this zero. And unlike most textbooks, I'm going to be extremely picky about putting that little minus there. We have the minus here canceling the minus here. So that will give me a plus. And the integral, oh, that's also going from zero with this little superscript minus to remind ourselves to include any singularities at the origin and infinity. And let's see, the s here, well, that's a constant with respect to time. I can just pull it out in front. And so I'll have an s sitting out in front of the integral like so. And then inside here, I'll have xt e to the minus st with respect to time. And oh, look, big surprise. This whole thing here, this is just the Laplace transform of little x. So I'm left with x of s times s minus x evaluated at zero. And again, I'm going to be careful to include that superscript minus sign. So this tells us that just as taking the integral in the time domain resulted in dividing by s, taking a derivative in the time domain results in multiplying by s. So that makes sense. But we have an additional complication presented by this term. This often arises in the context of solving differential equations as what's called an initial condition. I'm going to try to consistently call them pre-initial conditions to emphasize the role of that little superscript minus. And as usual, since we're dealing with unilateral, aka one-sided Laplace transforms, I'm not going to worry about region of convergence issues in this proof. But speaking of those issues, we do need to worry about regions of convergence in the two-sided, aka bilateral Laplace transform case. And for most properties, the bilateral Laplace transform property is pretty much more or less like the unilateral Laplace transform property. This is an exception. This minus this pre-initial condition term here is something that appears for the unilateral case, but not the bilateral case. 
And if you think back to Fourier transforms, we did have a Fourier transform derivative property that looked like this. It said that taking the derivative in time corresponds to multiplying by j omega in the Fourier domain. And yeah, if you take this j omega and substitute in for s, we get the same property. But there's another reason it doesn't work here, which is that I've got this big pre-initial condition term that does not exist in the Fourier transform situation. But remember, Fourier transforms were going from minus infinity to infinity. Remember back when I proved this Fourier transform property, I said this. Now, your first thought might be to tackle this the same way we did the delay property, which is just to take whatever we're trying to compute the Fourier transform of, put it into the Fourier transform integral, which multiplies against e to the minus j omega t dt, and then try to manipulate the result into something where you can find the Fourier transform of your original little x signal. Except doing this integral involves integration by parts. And I don't know about you, but every time I wake up in the morning, I think, how should I maximize my happiness? And then I think to myself, well, to maximize happiness, I really need to avoid integrating by parts. So we're going to take a different approach. Now, later in the class, when we look at Laplace transforms, we'll actually have to use this kind of approach to deal with a derivative property, and we'll have to integrate by parts, but we'll accept that pain and suffering when we come to it. And indeed, I could have proven that Fourier transform property using this integration by parts technique, but I avoided it by taking an alternate route for the proof that involved taking derivatives on both sides of the inverse Laplace transform. Well, why didn't I do that here? Why did I go through all this difficulty with this integration by parts when I've often said I try to avoid integrating by parts? Notice I haven't actually told you what the inverse Laplace transform was. If you go back and watch my Laplace transform lectures so far, and if you go back and watch the Fourier lectures, you'll see there's a big stylistic difference in that I'm constantly using both the inverse and forward Fourier transforms throughout those lectures. Here I haven't discussed the inverse Laplace transform at all. And in fact, when I first introduced Fourier transforms, I made a big deal about the inverse Fourier transform kind of being the bigger, more important idea than the forward transform. It says that under some conditions, I could take a function x of t and write it as a sum of sinusoids. And in that viewpoint, the Fourier transform itself is really just a magic recipe to tell me what the complex weights, what the amplitudes and phases of those sinusoids should be. But here we don't really have direct access to the inverse Laplace transform, and that's because it is a scary, scary thing. So this is one of the reasons I like to start the course with Fourier transforms and then move to Laplace transforms. It emphasizes this beautiful symmetry we have with Fourier transforms that doesn't really exist in the Laplace transform case. In the Fourier transform situation, we have forward and inverse transforms, each of which deal with functions of a single variable, either time or frequency. But when we move to Laplace transforms, suddenly our transform variable itself is complex valued, which which yields additional complexities, pun vaguely attended. And then in the Laplace transform case, we just don't have those same kind of symmetries anymore. There is some degree of symmetry in some Laplace transform pairs and properties, but it's not like the elegant symmetry we get in the Fourier transform situation. Remember with Fourier transforms, the very first thing I did is show you both the original transform and its inverse. But with Laplace transforms, although I can show you the forward transform, I'm really reluctant to show you the inverse transform. It's this bizarre construction involving a contour integral in the complex plane that every textbook I'm aware of just presents and then says we're not going to use it. We're just going to look at stuff in the table. So with Laplace transforms, the inverse transform is very, very different than the forward transform. So here I'm going to be a little bit rebellious and just not show you the inverse Laplace transform at all. You can go look it up if you really want to. So just for the sake of completion, let me scroll up here and write our Laplace transform property in the table. There we go. You will often see this shorthand notation of putting a dot on top of a function to indicate taking this derivative. 
This is particularly convenient if we want to start piling this property on top of itself. So let's say you wanted to know what double dot transforms into. So this would be a derivative of a derivative. And this notation is particularly nice. So what we'll do here is say that we'll have s times x dot of s minus x dot evaluated at this origin with a special little superscript minus here. And now I can apply this Laplace property again to this guy. We'll just take this and substitute it into here. So that will give me s times s big X of s minus x evaluated at zero with this minus superscript. All of this minus x dot at that origin. And now if I multiply the s through, I'll write s squared big X of s minus s times x evaluated at this pre-initial location minus x dot evaluated at the origin. This turns out to be really handy in solving differential equations with certain pre-initial conditions. And you can keep expanding this. You can go up to a triple derivative or a fourth derivative or whatever, and they'll all have the same pattern. You'll have s to the power of whatever the power of the derivative is, and then you'll have a series of those s's decreasing in power down to what's basically s to the zero over here for the last term. And as that decreases, you'll have a bunch of terms show up with little minus signs in front, and each of those is increasing in the derivative of the time domain function that you're evaluating at zero with this minus superscript.